this now. Welcome everybody to the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Community Education event for today, which is an author series with um, Brad Stewart and his book, Facing Death. Um, the foundation was just introduced just before I turned on the recording. For those of you that missed it, I'll put up the website in just a moment and you can go take a look at all of the good work the foundation is doing. And um, my introduction of Brad Stewart, um, I'm gonna bring him down here and we are going to be down here together now, Brad. Um, Brad has was the very first medical director I ever met when I started working at um, a hospice back in 1997. Um, and uh, Brad did quite a long commute actually to come down and help us out without our medical director. Uh, Brad was just great to work with. I had cared for people for about 10 years dying of AIDS and cancer my friends from the time I was about 30 to 40, but never formally. And sitting around a table once a week, talking about our patients, their illnesses and the things that they needed for good support. Brad was just an amazing person to listen to and to hear. Um, my only experience prior um, had been listening to Stephen Levine workshops and coming to a hospice program with a medical director that really believed in um, whole person approach, really recognizing the role of uh, spirituality as part of the dying process um, was just a really wonderful thing to hear. So Brad, I'll just read this and then I'm going to go ahead and have you go up, you go ahead and introduce yourself. Brad has practiced general intern medicine, treating patients in his office, the emergency room, the hospital, the ICU, and then the latter half of his career was devoted to caring for the dying. He first served as a medical director in 1993 and then became the chief medical director for a hospice program at a large healthcare system in Northern California. In the 90s, he headed a team that developed a beautiful program for working with advanced illness management, the AIM program. And um, I think we can talk more about that. Um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation um, offered a large grants and Brad's written over 50 peer reviewed papers and book chapters, um, hundreds of talks internationally. And I'm just so grateful that you are here today, Brad, for this program. And please now, um, I'm going to turn this over to you. Um, I'm going to move myself out here and um, have you go ahead and introduce yourself and talk about your beautiful book. So here I go. And there you go. Thanks, Brad. Okay. Well, thank you, Susan. And hi, everybody. Uh, this is a... Uh... Uh, this is an amazing occasion for me. I mean, Susan, 1997, that's a long time. Uh, uh, we've, uh, you, Susan continues to do great work. And uh, I'm more or less retired from uh, the medical world. Uh, I worked with patients for a long time. Uh, uh, when I came into medical training, which for me started in 1974, um, I had experience with just a few things. Uh, I had done some brain research, which actually came in handy when I wrote this book, the, the last uh, part three there. I, I put some science in there. So uh, what I wrote about psychedelics and near-death experiences uh, and meditation wouldn't seem too woo-woo. But uh, really my my uh, my my brain research experience actually got me into medical school. I'd written a couple of papers and uh, that got me into Stanford uh, medicine. Uh, and I, I, the other thing I should mention is I had no religion whatsoever when, uh, when I entered medicine. I, uh, I was raised in a household where we were forbidden from talking about God. And, uh, you know, it was, that, that was, that was, that was what it was. And so I really had no uh, experience at all in spirituality. And uh, when I when I uh, when I went to uh, into medical training, uh, first two years were great. Third year uh, is when the medical students go on the wards and start seeing patients. And uh, if you read the book, you'll uh, you'll uh, read a couple of well, one story in particular about what happened and. I went from being really excited about uh, being a doctor in training to being really upset and confused because I, I could not understand why we treated 
seriously ill people the way we did. And so that, um, you know, the you'll read about the experience if you read the book, but I resolved back then, this was in about 1976 or so, that I had to write a book. And now it's almost 50 years later. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I what I didn't know I wanted to learn back then was, you know, we were being taught how to cure disease, but we were not being taught anything at all about healing. And it, it became clear to me pretty quickly that... Uh, particularly when your options for cure run out when you're treating patients, you've got to know how to, to help with healing. That, that's when it becomes real obvious that um, healing is what's, what's really needed. But where does healing come from and what is it? Um, I, it took me, <laughs> took me years of practice uh, and hospice before I started to get an inkling about that Honestly, it wasn't until I sat down and actually wrote the book, which wasn't at all what the book I originally would have written. I, I would have written an angry, uh, you know, a critical book that would have been horrible to read. Uh, by the time I actually sat down to write this, I realized that what it's really all about is spirituality. And, and I was completely ignorant. Anything I learned about spirituality was just by mistake. So the things that I'm going to talk about today, uh, you got to pardon me if I sound like I get kind of preachy, because uh, I think these things are really important. Uh, but I'm an amateur, you know, I, I am anything but a spiritual teacher. So if I start to sound like I'm going in that direction, you know, get out the hook and pull me back, because <laughs> it's uh, that that's not what I intend. Anyway, it, as it turns out, it, it, to, in my experience anyway, spiritual awakening is not at all, uh, you know, romantic or glamorous or woo-woo. Uh, it's simple. Uh, it's, it's very down to earth. Uh, it's simple, but it's not easy. And I'll touch on that again toward the end. But, you know, talking about the book, uh, uh I got good news and bad news for us all. Uh, you know, the bad news is really death is the biggest challenge you will ever face. For most people, it's not simple. It's not easy. And for some people, it's downright hard. I'll tell a story in a second that'll illustrate that. But the good news is uh, <laughs> uh, that where I'm coming from now, uh, Talking to most people, I'm guessing some of you here have experience in working with folks who are dying, but for those who don't, uh, dying really isn't what you might think it is. And that's because you are not really who you think you are. And I'll, you know, I'll get into that a little bit too, but the, the full title of the book is uh, Facing Death, Spirituality, Science, and Surrender at the End of Life. Uh, and I, I'm going to, you know, talk a little bit about each of those things, spirituality, science, and surrender. Uh, you know, to a, to a scientist like me, I mean, I've, I've done research and, you know, I I've, was addicted to science and I still am. I still try to keep up with things like astrophysics of, of all things. But, you know, what I, when I say spirituality, I don't mean at all anything having to do with organized religion. You know, what I'm talking about uh, with spirituality, where it relates particularly to the end of life, I'm talking about the mystical side of spirituality that, you know, wise people have been talking about for thousands of years. Uh, and that is, that's things like, you know, what we can see and touch is just not all there is. Um, there is something beyond us and maybe beyond our life uh, that is ultimate and eternal. And that's just a fact. Uh, after a while, uh, it's not something you have to believe or not. Um, it's just is. And if you have experience with psychedelics, you may have direct experience with, with some of that. Also, you're not an isolated self. Uh, you're an expression of, uh, of the infinite 
love of creation and you're linked to everyone and everything linked is a weak word uh you know we're, we're we'll talk about the limitations of language a little bit later on too but uh you know you are not alone you may not remember that when you're very ill and sick and nobody knows what to say to you and uh, you know you feel like you may have been abandoned even when people you love are all around uh it, it can that can be very isolating anyway spirituality is is critical si spirituality science and surrender science you know science has a problem i, I have to say even though uh i think it's We've only seen the beginning of the incredible changes science is going to bring to medicine and to many other things in this world. Um, but, you know, science, does, the scientific method doesn't work unless you buy into uh, the philosophy that what you can see and touch is all there is. There is nothing beyond that. I have friends who are scientists who really don't, want to read my book because they, they they think that this place that I'm coming from just isn't valid. And, you know, if you are into that uh, view of science and the scientific method, then you're trapped in this world. You, you have no way out. You uh, if if all if all that is real is what you can see and touch, uh, you're you can't escape. And, you know, you're you're an isolated self. Uh, basically, you're a random product of molecular interactions, and when they end, you will too. You know, it's a it's not a a, a pretty or optimistic way of of, uh, of seeing life or dying. Science has conquered spirituality in in many ways. Uh, spirituality is now, especially if you talk to uh, clinicians and academic centers and places like that, you know. Uh, Spirituality is kind of fringy. Uh, when, when people uh, have no more options for treatment, uh, the spiritual approach is call the chaplain and leave, go on to the next case. Um, but the, the reason that's happened with science is because it's so successful in the world, in this world. <clears throat> However, the reason why I put a lot of science into the last part of the book is there's new evidence coming out of brain imaging, my old 1970s field uh, in uh, meditation, psychedelics, and near-death experiences that really call into question all the assumptions that our scientific paradigm just takes for granted. Uh, you probably all have read, uh, you know, the studies on psilocybin that show that 80% of the time people with one or two doses of psilocybin, people with cancer with terrible dread and Death anxiety have their have their emotional symptoms relieved. Eighty percent. There is no other intervention, uh, you know, clinical psychology or medical intervention where one or two doses will do that. That 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 just doesn't exist. It's a game changer. And the the scientific reason why psychedelics work the way they do is that they inhibit the brain network that gives you your sense of self. Uh, a, a good dose of psilocybin or LSD will dissolve your self. Uh, those of you who have been there know what is involved with that, uh, and it can be an unbelievable, completely earth-shattering, mind-shattering experience, assuming you're in an environment and in a setting and with people who uh, are supportive. But Bear in mind <laughs> that uh, losing the sense of self is central, not just to the mystical experience that psil psilocybin induces, but to spirituality, real spirituality, and also to healing. And I'll explain what I mean by all of that in a second. So spirituality, science, and surrender. Surrender. Dying is all about letting go, not of course, it's about letting go of everything you possess and know and uh, and uh, of your body, but it's also letting go of yourself. 
uh, you know, people who have near-death experiences are now being studied scientifically. And, uh, you know, the people universally around the world across cultures report what it's like to lose yourself as you die. It's just, it's just the way it goes. So you have a choice, really. Um, your choice is to learn to let go now or don't bother and let dying do it for you because dying will do that. That's what dying does. Dying will piece by piece take apart everything you know, love, and have and everything you think you are and it'll leave one thing right before you leave and that is the real you will remain. And I'll, I'll say more in a second about what I mean by that. So uh, let me, uh, I'd like to read a couple of sections out of the book. Uh, the first it concerns, uh, part one of the book is just all stories. It's, it's how I made mistake after mistake uh, in my practice uh, and in, in hospice. I mean, the only way, if you're not going to be taught about healing in medical training, which so far isn't really happening, uh, you have to learn on your own. And uh, that's what I had to do. So uh, I want to tell the story of Edie, who was uh, a woman in her mid-30s, very young, who got breast cancer. And as happens with many young woman with breast cancer. She had a very aggressive form of breast cancer. So she marched herself into my office one day with her husband and two kids. I think they were like three and seven years old. And Edie says to me, uh, you know, in almost a menacing voice, she said, look, here's the way it is. I know that I'm going to die and it's not going to take that long. So when that time comes, um, I want to decide not to do anything else, and I want to be on hospice. And, you know, when when you're working with someone uh, like this or anybody who's going through this, my practice is you don't tell anybody anything. You ask questions. So I it occurred to me, well, you know, Edie, uh, you're young and you have little kids. How long are you going to feel this way? how are you going to feel when the rubber really meets the road and you actually start to get sick? And sure enough, I didn't, you know, I, I just said, when will you know? And she just looked me in the eye and said, trust me, I'll know. And her husband, Roger said, yep, she'll know. Cause Edie knew, Edie knew what she wanted at all times. So one thing led to another. Uh, she did get sicker. She changed her mind. She pursued every treatment she could find until the oncologist wouldn't treat her anymore. She traveled to Florida to uh, where someone uh, treated uh, uh, like 50 brain lesions with a gamma knife. Uh, that would have put most people in rehab for months. She wound up right back home, but she continued to get worse. And finally, she began to realize that she wasn't going to survive much longer. But could she admit she was dying? No. Uh, many people don't want to. Her husband, Roger, wanted her to. He thought that would be easier for her. But uh, I made a, a number of home visits, which you have to do. I mean, if you just see people in the hospital, like many docs do when people are ill, you have no idea what takes place behind closed doors and you lose all kinds of opportunities for healing. So probably on my third home visit with her, um, she was so sick, she hadn't been out of bed in, in days, maybe, maybe a couple of weeks. Uh, and she, uh, you know, she, she wanted to talk about what was going on and she just couldn't bring herself to do it. So I sat with her for a while and finally I said, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I got to go, uh, you know, uh, give me a call if you want me to come out again. So I, I went to get up and she said, no, stop. I want to give you a hug. So I said, okay. I, so I walked over to the bed and bent over to like, she was propped up on pillows to give her a hug. She said, no, no, no. I want to stand up and give you a hug. And I stood back and I said mm, to myself, no way. I mean, I, I have seen patients 
with advanced breast cancer in, throughout all their bones who stand up and just bearing weight breaks their hip. And I did not want to see that happen in her bedroom. So, you know, I, I she said, don't say anything. Help me get up. And it was Edie and there was no saying no. So I'll start uh, I'll start reading at, at that point. I reached out and took hold of her outstretched hands. I, I had helped her sit up on the bedside. Her knuckles were knobby. I leaned back and let Edie do the pulling. It was slow. The muscles of her arms had wasted away. Slowly she rose until she stood facing me. I took her in my arms. It was like hugging a little bird. Her bones were like fragile porcelain. I dared not squeeze her for fear she'd shatter. We held each other for a few moments. Edie sobbed once, quietly. Tears ran down my cheeks, too. We both knew this was the last time we'd see each other. Yet we couldn't talk about it, nor could we say goodbye. We held each other, partners in despair. I lowered her back down and swung her legs around until finally her head rested back on her pillow. She looked up at me. Thanks, she said. Anytime, I replied. We looked into each other's eyes. There was nothing left to say. Over the next few days, Edie grew weaker and weaker. She stopped eating, then drinking. A group of women friends stayed at her bedside, holding vigil with her as she struggled against letting go. Finally, she slipped into unconsciousness, this time for good. Roger called me the next morning. We kept Edie's body here, he said. It was the right thing to do. They did have a choice. Edie and Roger were both Orthodox Jewish and Buddhist. Roger continued, if you have time, stop by and you'll see why. I cleared my schedule and drove out to their house. Roger walked me back to Edie's room. It was a horrible night, he said. She fought so hard. But just as the sun came up, she lay back and relaxed. It was like she came back into herself. Then she just stopped breathing. We walked into Edie's room. Her body lay flat on the floor, face up, her head on a pillow under the open window. Maybe her friends had helped her crawl there. Her eyes were closed. A slight smile lit her face. Roger and I sat down on the floor on either side of her. We each put a, a hand on one of her cold gray shoulders and gazed at her face. We sat there together, the three of us, for a long time. Finally, Roger spoke. She always did everything her own way, he said. That's true, I agreed. Then she found a better way. It was a sight worth waiting for. Um, you know, the, <laughs> the truth is, all human beings, regardless of how much they struggle, finally will let go. But the, the question I always had was if if you let go of yourself then what's left you know uh, it's it's a frightening thing to let go of everything you know i mean uh, really what what some people think dying is about is you know you lose everything and then you cease to exist so if you voluntarily let go of yourself what's left over i mean what what What's still there and how does that connect? In some way, I knew that connected with healing, but I didn't know what that was. So <laughs> this, uh, this actually happened um, at a different time, but it, it was, this was an experience that happened at the other end of life that taught me something about uh, what it, what's in there besides just yourself. It was 10 p.m. on a winter night. The ER was quiet. As is usual, late at night, I was the only doctor in this hospital. Then a young guy threw the door open. A green Volvo station wagon was parked outside. My wife, she's pregnant, he cried. Her water broke. Lucia, the nurse, ran out to the car. Carl, the LVN, pushed a wheelchair out the door. He rushed back in, wheeling a young woman, pink nightgown stretched tight over her belly. 
her long brown hair spread over a puffy blue jacket thrown over her shoulders. She was panting hard. Lucia helped her up onto the exam table in the main treatment room. She had already taken the history. She said, this is Maria, 24 years old, uneventful pregnancy, decent follow-up, echo normal. This is her third, no major medical problems. That meant everything was good. But once a woman gets, into, gets to her third birth, things can happen fast. Maria knew this. I'm close. I want to push, she panted. Let's get you up here safe, I said. Keep breathing just like you are. You're doing great. Sure enough, when she was in position, the baby's head was already crowning. Okay, Maria, time to push, I said. The forehead emerged, then the eyes, the nose, and the chin. Bad news. The face was blue. Not dark blue yet, but still. Looking good, Maria, I said. Push hard. Push, push, push. The baby's neck emerged. The umbilical cord was wrapped around it twice. That's what was cutting off circulation to the baby from the placenta, hence the blue face. Progress slowed as the shoulders went through the last part of the birth canal. Finally, the right one poked out. I was starting to get nervous. Lucia, normally unflappable, was yelling for Maria to push. Come on, baby, come on. There, the other shoulder popped out. The rest of the baby slid out fast like a wet fish swimming in blood and amniotic fluid. It's a girl, I said. My left hand held her neck and upper back as she came out. I cradled her tiny butt in the palm of my right hand and swung her around, sitting her in my lap so I could unwind the cord from around her neck. I left some slack so the blood could start to flow. We were face to face, inches apart. Then it happened. She opened her eyes, little brown eyes and a blue face. Her gaze darted from left to right. She was looking for something. Her eyes met mine. That's what she was looking for, another pair of human eyes. But she was looking for more than that. She wasn't just looking at my eyes. She was peering deep into me, her brow furrowed. She was very aware and very focused. As for me, I was transfixed and transported to another place. It was strange, but comforting and familiar at the same time. I had no words, no thoughts. In fact, no mind. Just a feeling of astonishment and joy. Time stopped. I tasted eternity. Then I snapped back to this world, the one where I was doctor. That whole interchange lasted a second at most, and nobody noticed it but me. The baby won't remember. Her brain was far too young to establish memories. Yet in that moment, she certainly registered our encounter. I was privileged. I was the first human to wel welcome her to this place. I eased the umbilical cord up over her head. In a few seconds, she pinked right up. Lucia wrapped her in a warm blanket and placed her into her mom's arms. I examined them both. They were perfect, as close as you can get on this planet at least. I shook my head to clear it, then I started in on the paperwork. Once again, the night was quiet. So, you know, what happened there? I mean, I hadn't had an experience like that, maybe ever, um, and I, I didn't think, I was too busy to think about it at the time. It wasn't until later that it really um, started to dawn on me why that experience was so important and to me so critical for my learning. Um, and I think what it was, <laughs> was, you know, I stumbled into a truth. Um, that baby woke me up in a way that I hadn't, been woken up before um and it, what it wasn't until i wrote about it now you know 30 years later that i kind of realized what actually happened and it's that is that only when your mind stops do you know who you really are while your mind is going and yourself is talking to you which it does non-stop 
all day and all night in your dreams, um, you you actually are not in touch with who you really are. Nobody, least of all me, uh, ever thinks about that. But in that moment, uh, that baby woke me up. And as I thought back on it, and as I re-experienced it, I came to know that knowing who you really are, finding that place in yourself that has no mind, that is a void, uh, you know, that's empty, is closer to the real you than any place you're in when your mind is active and you're going about your daily life. Um, that, <laughs> that was my, it wasn't my first contact with the real me, but it was the one that made the biggest impression. Um, but I think the truth is the real you is silent. It's, it's hidden deep down inside the self that you think you are. And in order to access that place, people talk about mindfulness. Uh, Vipassana meditation is, the, I think, the classic example of a discipline that you can use to be as mindful as you can become of the things around you. But I think there's a step beyond that. Uh, it's going beyond mindfulness to mind emptiness. Uh, and I think in spiritual terms, uh, in terms of, of getting to know who you are, uh, why you exist, what healing is about, how you can help others, where you need to come from if you want to do that, uh, I think it's about the most useful thing you can learn. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a little further on in the book, um, this is in part two when I, I get into talking about what it seems to me that all of this is about. This is from a chapter called The You Within You. <clears throat> the answer lies within you. You won't find it by rummaging through the details of your life. That's because the details of your life are not within you. They're outside you. The real you, that is. The only thing inside the real you is pure awareness. No details. Your everyday self is completely immersed in those details. Your self believes that they constitute your real life. The answer is actually simple. It's, it's been right there in the middle of your consciousness for your entire life. You may never have noticed it, or you may have noticed it and moved on because it's so simple and ordinary that it, it just seems to have no value. It's just sitting there, a seemingly useless fact of life. It's like breathing. You do it all the time, but it happens beneath your awareness. You don't notice it unless you choose to. You know breathing is useful, but that's just because at a certain age you were taught you needed to breathe air to survive. Prior to that moment, why would you care about breathing or ever bother to even notice it? The secret lying there inside is, there are two yous. In fact, they are almost the same thing, but not quite. Those two yous are the I am, the real you, and yourself. You could say one is nested inside the other. They're so closely connected that you think they're one entity until you look closely. Then you can tease them apart. These two yous are each places within your own awareness. You can work out of, that is, center your awareness in, either one. But working out of one will allow you to let go of all the things you don't need so you can be free before you die. Working out of the other will keep you trapped and you won't even know it until you're on your deathbed. When you finally get there, you may be glad you did some prep work. Um, you know, the, I think if there's a secret here, it's it's hiding in plain sight. Um, your yourself, um, I mean, you built yourself. Uh, it, it's it's what you it's how you have learned to interact with the world 
so that you not only survive, but hopefully you succeed and you thrive and you do okay with others and you know, all the things that you're taught to do. You, your parents and your teachers condition yourself. A lot of it's genetic. Uh, you know, we, we all have uh, things that run through our families, personality traits and all that. But, but yourself that you build is not the real you. It's, it's your user interface with the world. It's like the home screen on your phone. Um, you, you have to look at it and you have to deal with it and go through it uh, if you're gonna make use of your life. But yourself, just like your phone, it's full of unused apps and it's full of apps that don't really uh, do anything good that you might be better off deleting them. I won't give you advice on which ones to do that with, but that would be up to you if you sit and think about it. But if you're going to do that, if you're going to uh, clean out your apps, you need access to your operating system. And that's that's the I am, that, that's the real you that, that's at the very center. Uh, the only reason I call it the I am is because uh, when Moses confronted the burning bush in that story in the Old Testament, uh, he knew he was talking to God. So he basically said, well, who are you really? You know, uh, and, uh, you know, God replied, I am that I am, which just, I think, basically means I am. That's it. Stop asking dumb questions and let's get on with business. You know, and it's the same thing uh, when Buddha was asked, uh, you know, what is reality? What's your real self? He would just hold up a flower because the, the flower is only there for a moment and it's beautiful and that's why it exists and that's it. And there's no, there's no explanation for that. So, you know, the finding that silent place inside, uh, I felt that was began to be the answer to my question of where does healing come from? Um, you know, what, where do you come from? Where do you go? What do you access when you really want to be of help to someone else or to yourself? I want to read a little bit from a, a chapter called Healing. Everybody needs healing. If you're alive on this planet, it doesn't matter how happy, successful, and satisfied you might feel. You need healing. Why? Because when you die, you will let go of all those things that made you feel happy, successful, and satisfied. Not coincidentally, when you arrive on your deathbed, you may be surprised to find that you feel unhappy, unsuccessful, and dissatisfied. You may discover you didn't do what you might have done with your life, and you'll certainly discover that you can't take along any of those things with you that made you feel happy, successful, and satisfied. There's only one thing you will take with you when you leave, the real you. Death is the biggest challenge yourself will ever face. You created, nurtured, and lived in yourself throughout your whole life. How could it ever be easy to let go of everything you've developed so carefully for longer than you can remember? You can set your intent to fully inhabit the real you. That's a useful thing to focus on because the I am arrived here when you were born before you became conscious enough to formulate any intent at all. And the I am will depart from here when you die with you on board, but with the self you developed so carefully left behind. You don't have to pack a thing. In fact, you may have some unpacking to do. Preparing for the end of life is all about letting go. Um, I think the answer to, you know, how do you do the kind of healing we're talking about is, you know, it, it happens automatically when you're within the real you. Um, discovering, it, it means discovering who you really are. And although language is terrible at um, expressing these things, there are some interesting words in English, so, and one of them is discover. You know, you uh, discover has this um, 
sense of you're finding something new that you have never seen before. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, um, that's great. Except if you, if you look hard at discover, it's like uncover. You're, you're actually uncovering something that you already know. And everybody already knows this. I already knew it. I had just forgotten. And not only that, uh, because I'd forgotten and didn't realize how important it was to center myself in who I actually am, that, that empty place where I'm connected to everything that's created in, out of love, because I forgot that, <laughs> I got lost. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what happens. Um, so discovering your, your, your true self or the real you means uncovering what's already in there. You already know. And they, you know, I don't know if you've noticed this, but often you'll get a tremendous realization that seems totally new, like you've discovered something revolutionary. And then when you really think about it, you say, well, you know, I already knew that. And th this is one of those that, that's why spirituality is not something that to glorify and, uh, you know, to, to strive for enlightenment. Uh, the spirituality I'm talking about um, is basic and ordinary and real and helpful and healing. Uh, you know, the kind of healing that really counts. Healing is also about remembering another really interesting word because, you know, um, it's so easy to feel alone and abandoned. Um, if you have any experience working with people who who are dying, uh, you'll especially at, when they're at home, or or maybe even more in the hospital, you'll know how lonely uh, an experience that can be. It's it's so easy to feel alone and abandoned when you're that ill, even when you're surrounded by people who love you because nobody knows what to say. And often nobody wants to bring up things that are obvious and things that you might desperately want to talk about. Nobody else wants to talk about them. And you, you feel like you're alone in a sea of well-wishers, you know, water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. That's when remembering, which is what, uh, which is a central part of healing. Um, remembering means be, again, becoming a member of that connected family that we all are. That was a key that I finally dawned on me when I tried to think through and feel through, why did I care so much? I, I couldn't figure out, why do I care so much about people who are suffering? What is that about? I didn't think I was like that. And yet I found myself deeply caring and wanting to help. And, you know, that, that was... That was unexpected. <laughs> I never expected to be that kind of person. And then I realized it's about remembering. It's about, again, becoming a member of the human tribe that we're all a part of. And deeper than that, the, 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 love, the love of creation that, that motivates us all that comes from some mysterious place that we'll never understand. I don't care what your beliefs are. I don't care what you read. We don't know where it comes from or what it is, but we know that it is. So healing is helping others remember so we can all be members together. Um, you can also heal yourself and, and you will, everybody will. Um, unless, like we said, you just want to wait and uh, you know let death do it for you but if you if you want to help heal yourself uh it's the same thing it's just harder i find to heal myself than it is to help others why because honestly in in my own experience sometimes it's easier to be kind to someone else than it is to be kind to yourself not only that the more you wake up and the more you can center in the part of yourself that's real, um, that's true, um, and that's empty, but connected, the more you realize that yourself, <laughs> who walks around doing things and saying things all day, has a lot of work to do on itself. 
the the more you realize the separation between who you really are and who you think you are. And if you're like me, um, you know, you got you may have a lot of work to do. And that that just realizing that is hard, let alone actually doing the work. That's why anybody who uh, says that spirituality is easy um, isn't doing it. I don't think. So I want to close this part. Um, I just want to read the last chapter, which uh, which kind of brings it home, and then we can. I'd love to get into Q and A. Uh, this is called the ultimate choice. Your time has come. You've been through the horror of your cancer diagnosis, the ordeal of the workup and treatment, the anxiety that comes when they tell you your treatment is finished. That is one of the hardest times in cancer treatment. You can't stop wondering if that's really true. After a few months of uncertainty, those dreaded symptoms return. Your doctors tell you what you need to go through next. There's a new immunotherapy drug. You try it and it buys more time. Then the symptoms recur. You're back to ground zero. You've arrived at the place that all patients dread and nobody wants to talk about. No more treatments are available. Your doctors say those words that should never be uttered. There's nothing more we can do. That's a lie, but you don't know it yet. You think you're out of options. You feel abandoned and bereft. You experience the purity of pure despair. You are facing death. Although you may feel certain that no one could possibly grasp the enormity of your distress, that's not true. Every single human being who has lived on this earth has faced what you are now facing, or they will in a future that's approaching faster than they might like. You may believe you have no more options, but you do have a choice. The odds of curing your disease may be low, but a warehouse of opportunities for your healing has been unsealed. Experienced and accomplished healers may be no further away from you than the phone in your hand. Palliative care and hospice people are well acquainted with the dread you feel, and they have a lot of practice at relieving it, along with the pain and other complaints that may be nagging you. After you meet them, you start to feel some relief. You wonder why no one introduced these people to you before. But your opportunities are still not exhausted. You have one more choice to make, and you don't have to wait until your body ceases to exist to make the ultimate choice, to let yourself cease to exist. Even if this happens only for a moment, you've touched the eternal. You may be one of the fortunate few who made this choice years before you were forced by illness to confront it. But whatever you've decided in the past, it's never too late to make the ultimate choice. The ultimate decision is to surrender, to trust that this single precious present moment you experience in pure consciousness is your own personal eternity. You may be surprised to discover that this moment and the next and the one after that are filled with a peace that surpasses your understanding. Many who have gone before you have made the same decision to let go and simply trust, to surrender into the discovery that you are already cared for now and through eternity. The ultimate choice is to surrender yourself so that only the real you remains. May peace endure through all your moments here. And I'll stop there. Wow, thank you so much, Brad. I feel like everybody could take a nice inhale and an exhale together here. Um, Thank you. For folks that would, um, for folks that have questions, I see Tom had a question. Uh, was it Tom? It was Tracy actually had a question. Um, 
If anybody has a question, please feel free to, thank you. Patrick is demonstrating how to raise your hand. So in a Zoom, <laughs> if you raise your hand, you can go to the bottom. If you take your mouse and go to the bottom of the keyboard, there is um, a hand raising or a smiley face, or it says more. And under some of the, one of those uh, menus will say raise hand. And if you click on that, then I will see that you have raised your hand. Tracy, you've unmuted yourself. Is that because you would also like to ask a question? Yes. Okay, thanks. So we'll do Patrick, Tracy, and then we're gonna come back to the question that's in the chat from possibly Tracy. Okay, Patrick, I'm gonna bring you down here so it looks like you two are actually having a conversation. Thank you. Why don't you go ahead and uh, ask your question? Well. Brad, let me let me say this. I'm I'm going to buy your book. I didn't expect <laughs> to to be on, on this workshop and be have my eyes full of tears near, nearly the whole time. Um, so thank thank you for your insight, your wisdom. I've been a hospice chaplain for a long, long time. And the kind of spirituality that that you've been talking about, that you experience is so real and so powerful. And it's so different than how most people understand or talk about uh, spirituality or the religious experience. And I completely agree with you that it, it's mystical and very difficult to have the right languaging around it. But you know, when you're when you're doing hospice documentation, you know, you have to say something that follows the medical model. You know, there's always a goal and an intervention. And uh, over the years, I mean, part of the language that I've used in documentation, uh, it's almost cliche. I've used it so much, but you know, when I, when I try and describe what the experience for the patient or the family is, I use the words uh, ministry of presence. Uh, and that over the years, even by hospice professionals, including docs and RNs have, have been sort of discounted the value of just presence. Book, of just presence because right. you know uh, the the model is you always have to be doing something saying something <laughs> helping someone in a way that um is uh, is useful but the just sitting there with someone perhaps holding a hand or getting a glass of water with a bent straw, uh, it is is still. I mean, you've you've talked about hospice folks in very laudable ways, and and you should. Uh, I think for the most part, but but still, even in the profession, presence and attention and focus mm -hmm. is discounted. Uh, to a large degree, at least it has been in my world. Can you speak a little bit about this? Because I, I do, and I have felt alone uh, myself in my just trying to be really, really, really present with someone. Can you address that at all, the kind of thing that I'm describing? Oh. Uh, you know, the <laughs> I can't remember if I mentioned at the top of this hour, um, this is the first time I've actually talked. Uh, I mean, I've given lots and lots and lots of talks. This is the first time I've been with people talking about this since I wrote the book. I mean, the pandemic. Um, yeah, Susan, thank you. <laughs> so as you were... <laughs> As you were talking, Patrick, I mean, I thought of 50 different things that I would want to say, honestly, because okay. you taught that's how many different aspects, uh, that's how many different facets of this diamond of presence you, you just touched on. I mean, uh, there's so much to say. I, I think, 
you know, if you stick with the model of, uh, you know, the I am, which is who you really are inside, that that's where you, I, you know, I, just looking at you and hearing what you're saying, I, I know you know that place and you know how to abide in that place and come from that place. I, I've, i uh, you know, one thing that occurred to me w when you were talking was the medical model and the medical record the way it is now, everything is always pushing everyone away from being a human being toward being a human doing, you know, but it's about mm -hmm. action. It's about action. It's about mm -hmm. finding a problem and fixing it. And I could go on a forever about that. <laughs> but I, Me too. <laughs> but I think, I think the, I think the, if, if you're going to stick with this paradigm of the real you and yourself, I mean, uh, you can probably tell listening to me, I've been through a lot where, I mean, I have cultivated a really complicated, effective, high achieving self. I mean, I, <laughs> I can do that. I, you know, that that's what's so distressing about really getting how inadequate that part of yourself is. And yet, uh, there you have to have a foot in both worlds when you're working with people, especially in a, in a medical environment. You, you just have to learn how to do both. And I can't tell you how many times I've sat with people who <clears throat> who were going through agonizing times. And of course, as a physician, I've got lots of tools. I can I can talk about the Medicaid. You know, there's all kinds of stuff to talk about. So I've just learned to say one thing with my medical self, my doctor self. And I'm very aware that as I'm saying those things, other things are coming across that are deeper. Mm -hmm. You know, reassurance, um, um, a, a common a commonality of being together in the middle of this horrible place that is happening and yet we can be together. I'm aware of uh, there's a certain kind of strength that comes from saying nothing at all and just being in your in in your real self and that that strength is contagious. And it almost, if you're in that place, I don't think it really matters much what you're doing with yourself because it's going to be it's going to be good and effective and healing whatever it is. So I think what where the distress comes in 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 what you're saying is that um, learning to be present, which is hard takes incredible it takes time and work uh and skin in the game <laughs> and long experience to to be able to be really present um i used to think that i i uh, you just leave your baggage at the door and that's enough but that's not enough it, you know it, the only thing that's really gets you there is to be really centered within yourself and i don't think um you know one of the things that's useful about learning to be in your the real you is it's a great place it's the only place that you can experience things that are really unpleasant and you can release them without consequences or or without creating something worse you know, if you're in your self and you're thinking about it's it's really horrible the way this isn't recognized and uh, it really ticks me off and I'm very disappointed in the system. I mean, believe me, I've been through that for years, that being in that place. Um, that's like worshiping the problem. I mean, it's it's like there's this whole... <laughs> Like I say, I'm not religious, but there's this old saying that, you know, don't bring God to your problems. Bring your problems to God, meaning be in that place where you're connected. Be, be, where, be, be where you really are 
And as long as you're there, then go ahead and let that stuff come up about, you know, this system is not built for people who value just being present. It just isn't. So let that come up, but don't leave that place. Stay in that place because that's the place where you can actually release. And in my experience, some of that stuff that's bothered me forever, at least in this lifetime, uh, it actually goes, goes away and doesn't come back much. And if it does, it's easier the next time. And so yes. that's the best I can say. I, but I, Thank you so I, much. Speaking of being together, Patrick, I'm with you on this. I mean, I, every word you said really resonated with my experience and with me. And all I can say is um, don't change anything about who you are. Um, you. If you change anything at all, it may be where you live in yourself when you're feeling that distress, that that can really get to you. And, uh, you know, that's that's better to let that go. But there's I'm only aware of one way to do that. And that's stay, stay and in, stay inside the real you, which is easier said than done. That, they call it spiritual practice. That's what they're talking about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, by the way. That was a great question. Now, here we go. Okay, I'm going to bring in, let me go back and find Tom now. Tom is going to join us for a question. And there you go, Tom. And then, uh, and you are unmuted. You can just go on ahead and then we'll go to Tracy. You can hear me? We can. Yes. Okay. So early on, Brad, you mentioned the 1960s and the 1970s. And uh, I was there, there too. And I had the very, very good fortune to meet a doctor who had a foundation. He was a doctor of psychiatry. And slowly he taught me, as well as others for 20 years, that um, doctors who prescribe medication to someone rather than hold their hand or put their hand on their shoulder are missing the boat. And so this foundation, which was called the Center for Attitudinal Healing. Oh, I know that place. And I know. I think I know who you're talking about. I don't have to say or describe anymore, except it made me who I am. Well, I should say who I am not. So I used to be somebody, but going through that foundation for that many years and becoming part of it taught me that what you're talking about, Brad, is what he talked about. And I've been carrying what he talked about for 50 years. And you come along with the same message. And so I am I know how to appreciate you because I learned from Jampolsky. So thank you very much. And uh, let's see, I must be able to think of a question. <laughs> are, you, are you still in business? Um, the business I'm in now, well, I, I don't know, to be honest. I mean, I'm, I'm not seeing patients in a practice. I do have uh, lots of people I know, neighbors, friends, and others who call me when they're, mm -hmm. when they need it, you know, um, uh, so I, I do that, but I don't, I, this book just got published and I have no idea where it's going to lead. So, uh, my wife just said to me before we before I came on here, she said, uh, hey, you know, maybe we should buy an RV and you can like drive around and be an itinerant preacher. So that could happen. I don't know. But Mercenary doctor. Say the, say the name of the book, would you? Uh, let me, uh, it's called Facing Death. There's there's probably some way to... Um, I've got it up in the chat, Tom. I'll put it up again. I'll put the, you can, the link where you can go look at it. Um, Thank you, Susan. Yeah. Thank you. Here's, You're here it is, is, although it may be backwards. No, nope, it's perfect. Good. Yep. I just oh, it is? It's backwards. backwards. Even it's, backwards, it backwards. it's backwards on mine, but... Yeah. yeah. It yeah. would make sense even if it was backwards. 
going to be somehow perfect. Um, so the book is up there. And thank you. Two people have already said that they purchased the book from the link that was posted earlier. So thank that's great. You. And are you are you in the Bay Area or are you, you're somewhere else? Yeah, I still live in the same place. I've lived in Western Sonoma County for 45 oh, okay. years. I'm I'm near a town called Forestville and my medical practice was in Santa Rosa and I'm still here. It's okay. Wonderful. Living on the edge of the redwoods. It's, it's <laughs> nice. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, blessings to Jerry. I haven't uh, been in touch with him for so long. Jerry gave it all up. He's dead now. So you yeah, I, I've heard that. But, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. He died, I think two years ago, maybe. But for those that don't know what we're talking about, the Center for Attitudinal Healing was started by a psychiatrist. He got a group, he was directed to get a group of seven to eight children who were terminally ill together and just observe them, which he did for about a year and a half. And then he wrote down some principles that he described as principles of attitudinal healing and set up the center that was free to anybody in need. And it was just a godsend during the AIDS epidemic for sure. So yeah, lots of people wow. in the Bay Area. Uh, that do end of life work actually went through the <laughs> Center for Attitudinal Healing at some point. I facilitated a group for young adults with terminal illness. And yes, Bonnie, he wrote Love is Letting Go of Fear. That's Love great. is Letting Go of Fear. That's right. He wrote a couple of very small books that were incredibly impactful. So thank you, Tom. And now uh, let's go to Tracy. And Tracy, I'm going to try to find you up here before you start talking. I may have better luck. Let's see, I just had well, you. Here I am. <laughs> I know. If you raise your hand using the hand raising thing, that makes it easier. Oh, that one takes me a while to find. Okay, <laughs> let me just look here again. Okay. So can find you. There you are. Oh, gosh. You just oh, okay. <laughs> Aha, hand raiser. Fantastic. And then we'll go to Shay. Thank you so much, Tracy. Why don't you go ahead? Brad, um, I appreciate everything you have to say, but I have an issue, very personal issue. I've been on the spiritual path for over 50 years. I've even written books uh, taught related to it. And I'm very much in touch with my inner silence and that inner peace space. And it's an incredible place to be, to let go, to be in. But I am in horrendous physical pain, and I've been in horrendous physical pain since 1978, and none of the spiritual work I do alters that or the time period in which I'm incapacitated. And since I only get 500 a month social security and disability, I have to support myself in the few hours a day in which I can function. So I have not been able to find that that beautiful silence place alters my physical state. And it is in my body because due to some marvelous psychotherapy I was in in the 80s, I learned to let go of a lot of gunk in my heart and open my heart. And my heart feels like a vast auditorium where that peace just expands. But the physical pain is a nightmare and the having to support myself is a nightmare and I live in senior housing and I'm about to get evicted because I can't pay my rent and I have no help. So how the hell do I bring that peaceful healing energy into my life? Hmm. Oh, well, I mean, when, uh, <clears throat> I don't know how many years I did hospice, but, um, the, one of the first things you learn, first you're taught it, and then you figure it out right away after you see one or two people, is, uh, is that when you're in physical pain, it colors everything. I mean, it, it, there's no way around it. It's uh, the, the, even if you look at the, at the neurophysiology of it, I mean, the, the pain centers in your brain, if they're if they're activated and they stay activated, it's called recruitment. They they pull other centers in and involve them in your brain. And that's why uh, chronic pain is often associated with depression and uh, lots of other emotional stuff. And when the physical pain is in your gut, that saps a huge amount of your energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I have... Uh, <clears throat> 
in my own case, uh, you know, I've, I've been through cancer. Um, I had surgery luckily, and I don't think I'm still dealing with it. Um, I had a hip replacement that went bad and had to have it done over again at the same time that um, a spinal fusion I had when I was 20 went bad. And I, so I had spinal and two hip surgeries within a year or two or three. And I went through probably eight solid years of um, so much pain that I had to, I counted my steps. I could walk about 40 steps before I had to bend over and put my hands on my knees. I, mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, as I was going through that, I mean, I'm seven, I, I just turned 74. Mm-hmm. I thought when I was going through that, I thought I am at least 10 years older than my age. I, I felt mm-hmm. like I was 85 or 90, somewhere in there. And I, I really thought many times that if, it, if that kept going, I didn't know how much longer I was going to survive because the pain changed everything else. I, you know, There's a little say, test you can take online about your physical age. I am 73, and uh, my physical age is 92. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, it's very hard. to. This is one of those, I mean, one, of, one thing I learned a long time ago is that as a physician, um, you're trained to um, look at a problem, split it down and, you know, take it apart uh, and then split it up as much as you possibly can and then fix each part. Uh, And, you know, I know a lot, a lot of my friends and colleagues who are doctors, when they're asked a question like you just asked, uh, they will say anything, but I don't know. It's so tough to have a fix it mentality and to want to help and to say, I'm not sure how um, your situation can can be improved. I think it sounds like you've done pretty much everything that you can possibly do. You're not a sit in your chair and feel bad about it kind of person. So uh, I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's, important to continue what you're doing and to make sure i mean one thing i one other thing i've learned having treated a lot of pain in my time that uh, it's really important to uh, seek out uh, people who are good at treating pain and i say that uh, with memories and knowledge of so many oncologists, pain specialists, uh, who I really honestly think they don't know what they're doing compared to what I learned how to do. And the only reason I learned how to do it, I, I, I learned how to do it because I, I, I had to be up at night figuring out how to keep people from calling 911. And so I tried stuff that uh, it's you know, really I, difficult when one is on Medicaid in this country be able to, to be able to see the kind of practitioners that might be helpful. It's true. It's true. And so I'll, I can't say much more than, uh, you know, I, I hear how really, really difficult the, uh, the, the situation is. And it's, uh, it's painful to me that I don't know if I can say anything or do anything that's going to make it better for you. I, I don't know where to go with it other than that. Well, and, thank uh, you for your very human response. And, and I will say finally that instead of making me bitter, the suffering I go through is help deepening my compassion and love and my spiritual wisdom. And, and that's the best I can do. And I'm grateful for being able to do that. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that, Tracy, because I was tempted to say something like that. And I held back and didn't say it because coming from me that just sound, that just felt to me like it'd be off if I said that so yeah. I'm so glad to hear you say it because I I think that is one of the good things that can come out of it and coming from you I'm really happy to hear that thank you very much and thank you for the work that you're doing it is important yeah. thank you
Tracy, I just said thank you, and it's always good to see you here. Yeah. We're going to go to Shay next, and then we're going to go to Louise's question, and then back to Dia. I hope I said that right. Go ahead, Shay. You're on. Yes, thank you, Susan. I'm you're in welcome. the car. Stop to listen to the doctor, and there is nothing new that I'm going to tell you, doctor. And you probably had heard it many times over. As you were talking of letting go, and probably that's a scary thing, and you mentioned it, and uh, people in that time, in that moment, but I'm, I am pretty sure everybody who is there listening to you were feeling that uplifting. Mm -hmm. And I probably has never been so deep within and just listening to you talking. And uh, it's so beautiful also to hear a scientist talking about spirituality. There's nothing more beautiful than that because it's almost two worlds that doesn't come together for some. And when you hear a scientist talking about that, it's, uh, it reminds me of one of my uh, 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 mathematic, uh, mathematic professor that was doing a piece on the board. And then he said to me, after you do this number, you have to say, I don't know if you talk about God tonight. I don't know because I missed your, uh, the beginning of your, of your uh, reading. But he said, you have to feel there is something bigger and greater. And uh, again, I could hear, I could listen to you without stopping. It was so, it was so peaceful. It was so deep. I, I think it's the most relaxation that I have felt. Thank you so much for touching our heart. And I think what your wife mentioned, you should go on too. I will be in line. All of us will be. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. thank you. Thank you, Shay. That was beautiful. And uh, let me say a word about science because I, I actually write about this in the latter part of the book. I didn't want to put it at the beginning because uh, there's a lot of people that don't feel the way maybe you do about it, but um, I think science has a lot to learn also. And in fact, I wonder the, the way the way science works, um, and th this is actually in the book. I mean, scientists, uh, I really admire how scientists think in a way. I don't admire the box that we're in uh, that comes from long ago that we won't go outside this thing about, you have to see it, touch it and measure it, or it's not real. I think we may wind up, I don't know how long it'll take, but I think science may have to wake up to the findings that are now coming out of research on especially psychedelics, but also meditation and near-death experiences because real research is happening in those areas now. And here's how science works. Scientists know I mean, you, a real scientist will never say, we know the truth. A real scientist would never say that. A real scientist would say something like, what we know has brought us as close as we now know how to get to what's real in the universe. Not, not beyond that, but in the universe. They'll never say they have the truth. What, they, what they'll do, though, inside is they'll take the, the highest... Uh, most advanced theories that have been developed and they're hungry for some finding to come along that contradicts the, the best of the current theory because that means that there must be something new to be discovered. There must be some new theory that's better than the one we now have and all scientists are hungry for that. So I'm wondering if we're not on the edge of, although it could be a long, ed, long time, uh, all these findings on how the brain actually operates uh, in meditation and with psychedelics and, and the, the things people report from near-death experiences when the brain is completely shut off fully and totally what they're still experiencing. Um, I wonder if that's not going to start uh, making some scientists think about having to get beyond uh, this incredible limit that we've had ever since Galileo about if you can't measure it, it's not real. I, I just think science needs to wake up just like the rest of us. 
And I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if that happens before a whole lot more time go, goes by. I hope it's in our lifetime. So, and as far as, I mean, the best thing, I've gotten some feedback on the book. The, the nicest thing anybody's ever said so far, besides what you just said, <laughs> was uh, somebody wrote, uh, I felt like I was meditating the whole time I was reading. And when I when I heard that, I went, okay, that that's that's great to hear because you know I really I wanted this book to come from a place that was deep enough that it would evoke that kind of feeling. And if if that's what the book does, and if that's what the the talking does, that's I feel like that's the job right now. So. I really appreciate the feedback. It's it it's very helpful. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, Kay. We have, thank you so much, Shay. I'm going to put you back up here, and then Louise had a question, Brad, for you, and then we're going to come back to is it Dia? Um, okay, we'll come back there. Um, Brad, she wanted to know if you have had any experiences with this was new to me. Um, a shared death experience. Are you familiar with that? I have not heard of that, no. Um, so I did a little research while you were answering two questions. And it's the experience, I believe, and Louise was the person that posed the question. She can correct me if this is incorrect. But it looks like it's the experience of when the person is dying, the person at the bedside, the caregiver, the loved one, has a shared experience of actually feeling like they come up and out of their body and go off. Mm -hmm. Some people see the tunnel of light. Some people see have seen beings. Um, that's as far as I got because I wanted to come back here. But when I read that, it kind of shocked me because my very first death that I have ever attended with my friend Jeff, I ghosted him for three full years and would only go to see him when other people from our softball team would be there and or if we were at a public event like his birthday or something else. But in the last week or month of his life, I ended up being there with him every day or every other day. And one day, um, I'll skip a lot of the other stuff, but he was sort of unconscious in the bed and I was sitting next to it and I had just softened my belly and heard Stephen Levine's voice going through my head saying, you can keep your heart open in hell. I'd gone to one talk he had given a month earlier and left because I didn't understand a word Stephen was saying. So here I am a month later, my friend's in a coma, it's not going well. I'm at the bedside grabbing his hand so hard I realized later I was probably crushing it. He was getting more and more restless and then we had this experience where he like went out of his body, out the window, he's heading out of Daly City. And I was like right there. And I kept my mind, my awareness was saying, you have really not lived in California long enough for this to be happening. And then a friend came in downstairs and slammed the front door so loud that we both just kind of popped back. And he had been in a coma, but he opened his eyes and I like opened mine. I looked, I was looking at him and he looked at me and he just said, that just happened, didn't it? And I was like, uh, yeah, that just happened. He was like, okay. And then he went back to sleep and I just was like, oh, I guess my life's just completely changed. <laughs> so um, the shared death experience, you have not had an experience of that or heard reports of this. I rarely tell people about that. Now I do more, but I didn't for years because I thought for sure they'd think you've just lost your mind there. Um, no, it doesn't surprise me though. I mean, that, you know, yeah. the, when, uh, you know, when you're in your normal life and your normal self, yes. uh, everybody's separate. And <clears throat> that's something happens when somebody's close to death. And uh, I don't know how to explain it, you know, scientifically or any other way. But it's kind of like everything gets more permeable. And okay. this the separation thing really kind of, it, uh, it doesn't always break down, but it really changes. And so I'm not surprised at all to, to hear that something like that happened. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, the, um, yes. Well, let's go to this question here. Thank you, Brad. Um, is it Dia or is that, was, did I pronounce that correctly? Thank you. And then we'll come back to Natalie. Here you go, Dia. Why don't you go ahead? You unmuted already. Okay, hi, and thank you. Um, Thank you, Brad, Dr. Stewart, for your presentation. And um, Barbara, it's funny. Wait, Barbara? Anyways, um, that Stephen Le Levine, Levine was mentioned because that's kind of part of my question. 
Um, I was really moved. And oh, first of all, I want to say that you're welcome here in Rochester, Minnesota. I would coordinate um, a speaking engagement um, if that's on your um, travel route. Yeah, um, yeah. Do you mean you mean uh, Mayo Clinic? Uh, well, I don't know if I can get you at Mayo, but I can get you in Rochester. But I was really moved by um, the your um, talk about that baby and the visual connection with that baby, that newborn. And uh, after reading Stephen Levine and and um, thinking about the reincarnation, I'm neither here nor there with that. But think you know the way he talks is like we are reborn into that kind of experience. And I just wonder if you've had others like that, or if you had an insight, like this baby has some wisdom and then of course we're born and then we kind of lose what we had before, or maybe it's, it's um, you know, floating around inside our, our souls or something. But I just wondered if you wanted to comment a little more on that, please. Yeah, Dia, that's a huge topic and a huge question. I here's my position on on that. Um, I I I focus. I think I've kind of chosen to focus on the on the area of, of approaching as death approaches and as birth happens right after. Anything, and I I think uh, well. My way of explaining what happened with the baby was that I don't know, and I don't, I would never pretend to know um, what happens after we die. I, reincarnation is real possible, and it, there's all kinds of material out there mm -hmm. uh, about people where it's really hard to believe that they haven't lived before because they know so many details, little kids, about their lives when they were fighting in World War II as one example. You know, there, there's all those stories out there. I just haven't focused on that because I just don't know. My, my, uh, my feeling, um, and I guess it's my belief about the baby in me was that, you, you know, if you've delivered enough babies, you'll find that a lot of them, uh, my, I, I delivered both my kids at home and my son was the same way. He came out and he looked me right in the eye. And I was surprised because babies aren't supposed to, you know, their brains aren't supposed to be working all that well when they're very, when they're first born. And then I, after I thought about it, one, ex, there, there's two mm -hmm. different explanations. One is physical and one is spiritual. Physically, mm -hmm. uh, when a baby's born, it has to find another set of eyes because that's where love and nurturing and sustenance are so you've got to look around for eyes because if they're not there there's a problem so i think it's inborn mm -hmm. kind of an instinct but also my sense with this baby anyway was that when when this baby came in um the second she was born before she even while she was still blue, I mean, she wasn't even oxygenating very well, but even so, she opened her eyes and looked and found my eyes. And I think um, finding another pair of eyes is one way to connect up, to, to reconnect mm -hmm. with the place where before she was born, she was really connected. And the, as you're in the uterus and as you mature inside your mother, and especially as you're born, you're divorced from that place that you came from. And it, to me, it, it, this is just my guess, but it would be natural as a baby to open your eyes and look for another set of eyes, because that's where you can mm -hmm. find that connection that you, has just been lost for you when you came out. And it's even better if you open your eyes when you're first born and you find somebody who will look straight back at you and reflect the awe uh, and the love that you remember from where you came from. I mean, again, uh, I don't know about the science of it, mm -hmm. but what people report, babies can't report anything because they're just not capable, but people who die and 
and are brought back, which is becoming a whole lot more common now because resuscitation science and critical care are getting so good that we just don't let people die unless we absolutely have to. So a lot of people are brought back and they all say the same thing. The, the stories are, there are exceptions, but they're pretty much all the same. And and uh, it has to do with um, finding, you know, getting reconnected with a place where reality is more real than anything we've experienced in this life when we're living in a self. And the love that's there, the love that we came from, that's why I think that's where the baby was coming from. The love we return to, that what we received back into uh, from the evidence appears to be so deep and so profound that uh, nothing compares, uh, nothing on earth compares to that. So I just think the baby was looking around for someone who would get it. <laughs> and I've had that experience with people who are dying also that um, people really appreciate having someone else meet their eyes where you can tell that there's a there's an intent and a desire to relate with love. I think healing, every act of healing is an act of love and a, and a, it's real. And when you get right down to it, it's the only thing that really is real in, the, in an ultimate sense. It's what everything is based on, no matter how much pain and other suffering we go through, it's there. So that's the best I can say. And as far as reincarnation, I just don't know. I, 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 I do, <clears throat> here's something, speaking of, I mean, I, I am not a Buddhist, like I'm not an any particular thing, but I've looked into Buddhism and, and uh, in particular, I've looked into what Buddha may have actually said the same way I've read the New Testament a few times to try to see what Jesus might have actually said, because at that I'm interested in. Um, I'm not clear that Buddha ever preached reincarnation. No. I think like the church developed around Christianity and came up with a lot of things that Jesus never talked about. And I'm not even going to get into the church these days compared to what Jesus said. I'm not even going to go there. Um, you know, I, I'm, I think Buddha was all about right now. Yeah, and, and the speaking of presence, like Patrick was saying, uh, that's the Buddhism is the Buddhism is the ultimate focus on presence. And what you find at the end of that search, I think, is just what we're talking about. And where that baby was coming from is that's the place. And, and so I, I don't know about uh, having lived before or ever living again. I I have my suspicions, but that's all they are, you know. Thank you. Um, we're about five minutes over. It looks like people that needed to go have gone. So, Brad, we have one more question. Do you mind answering that? And then no, that's fine. That want to stick around. I can stick around for a couple of minutes after this. Um, Madeline, why don't you go ahead? And there you go. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. This has been a wonderful discussion. <clears throat> and I want to say that I come from a background of um, medical social work for several years with hospice. And then from there, I went into doing death investigation. So I was literally on the other side of the bed or the table. And I did that for a number of years. What I, what I hear you talking about is what I have called a liminal space where I, I would find myself, and this is the same space that I experienced when my daughter was born and we had that eye-to-eye -eye contact the first time. I think it's a transpersonal space where we're no longer in the personal, the interpersonal, but rather we're even a step back from that. And it's, if if you look at the 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 bottom line, I I don't know what to call it, but the, the the story behind all of the stories that spiritual traditions tell 
they always come back to love being the principal principle of the universe. And so what you were saying about a baby looking for eyes to connect with, it's like when we leave this world, we go through the tunnel and we go to the light. And when a baby is born, they're coming from the light, they're coming through a tunnel of sorts and they're coming back into the light. And they're, so they're coming from that liminal space into 3D reality. And they have to learn how to be interpersonal in order to survive. And then they learn to be personal. And then at the end of the life, we have the option to look at becoming transpersonal again. And I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, I totally, I mean, that's, that's a, that's, that's using different language to say, I think the very same thing. Uh, um, one thing when I, when I wrote this book and when I, and uh, when I talk, um, I think Abraham Lincoln was a person who, uh, he wanted to communicate very high, very, very high spiritual th things and very complex matters in as basic a way as he possibly could. And that's my philosophy too. Uh, I think the transpersonal uh, and the liminal, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I don't personally use those terms, but I could. I mean, I think the, it's another way of saying the same thing. The, um, the way, uh, what I believe or kind of what I try to live now is that the, what you're calling the transpersonal uh, is another way of saying um, that you know, we we go around in the personal and the interpersonal, and by definition, we're in you're, you're living in yourself when you do that. If you're not living in yourself, you can't be personal or interpersonal. It's it's that's what life is like, and we all developed a self. Some of us were more successful or better at it, or more you know uh, whatever you want to call it more effective at it than others, you know, uh, developing a self that really can make it in the world and achieve things and all that. So, you know, some folks don't have that ability. And so their personal and interpersonal life um, isn't, uh, isn't uh, at a level that may even satisfy them. And, and it's, a, it's an issue for, for some people. But to me, the, the most important thing is really getting deep down that the personal and interpersonal um, is a, uh, an important place to master. But in order to um, in order to really succeed in life, especially as it starts to come to an end, or if you want to help other people and have anything to do with healing you have to engage in the transpersonal and in my language that means really practicing really learning to actually really be in your in the real you the i am the that place to really inhabit that place and to come from there and it's so challenging it's not hard to do when you're sitting with your eyes closed and your legs crossed, you know, that <laughs> that's some people really have trouble with that. You know, some people can't quiet their mind and they, I know a lot of people who can't meditate. They say they just can't get there, but that's relatively a breeze compared to being able to hold that space when you're in the interpersonal world, because people are constantly saying and doing things the glance off stuff that you have stored up from your past. It, it just happens again. It's constant and it's, uh, it's, it'll immediately distract you away from that place where you would like to stay, but you're just not there anymore. And that, that's what takes practice in the interpersonal. So I, I think the transpersonal as you're talking about is sort of the goal 
of regular living. It's just hellaciously hard to accomplish. It, I think it is doable. I, you know, once in a while I find myself able to kind of pull it off, but it's not a space that is real easy to maintain. Um, like for instance, if you're giving a talk to a big room full of doctors, very tough to maintain that space, <laughs> but it can be done. It, it really can. Um, and, and you mentioned Vipassana um, meditation and that's a meditation of paying attention to everything that comes within your purview. And if, if one can master that, then the rest of it is a piece of cake. That, I think that's true. I, I think Vipassana is a very uh, highly developed form of awareness. It's, uh, you know, it's, it takes, a, well, like anything else, it takes a long time and a lot of practice to be able to get to the point where you really get that yourself is not a real thing. You can get there through Vipassana. And uh, that takes that takes some time and some real dedication. But I agree, it's a it's a it's a it's a great way. One of one of the one of the great ways to this on this path. Thank you so much for your work and for your discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Brad, thank you so very much. Thank you so much to Madeline for that question. I'm going to jump back down here again. Um, thank you all those that, that have been able to stay on. Um, this is this is the longest one we've done, Brad. So I just want to say on behalf of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation, thank you all very much. I know some of you were able to make a donation to the foundation, and if that's possible, I will put this up here again. If you guys could hold one second, there's a place there. Um, our community education programming is completely supported by uh, donations, so um, we appreciate anything and everything that people are able to do in that room. And um, on behalf of the Elizabeth Cooper Ross Foundation, Brad, thank you so very much, and I will just officially um, sign us off now. One second, you'll all hear that, and then I'll stay on if people want to ask like sort of informal questions of me. You're welcome to do that. I don't know if Brad can stay or not. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye-bye.